Well, welcome everybody to Crossway's online service. My name is Stephen Fogg. I am the online campus pastor here at Crossway. And uh, an especially big welcome if it's your first time here today at our church service online here at Crossway. Um, wherever you're watching from, whether you're in Asia or South America or North America or Europe or the Middle East or Africa, wherever you're watching from, from any of those continents, you are always welcome to join us. Every single week we do these services multiple times on the weekends. I know a lot of people watch these services back. So even if you're watching this back, a big welcome to you for this service. Hey, we've got lots coming up in this service. Um, we are continuing our sermon series, uh, Living Among Lions. And Pastor Mark Purser is gonna be preaching the word to us today and we have James and the team leading us in worship. So be expecting of what God is gonna do in your lives. I know he's got incredible plans for your life. Um, and for some of you, just you bursting at the seams wanted to know what they are, but just be expectant, open your hearts and minds to what God will say throughout this service. If it is your first time here this week, big welcome. Go dive into the chat and let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to know where you're watching from. So go ahead, if it's your first time, last, you know, you've been here a hundred times, go and welcome people uh, if they're in the chat there for the first time. Let's be a welcoming community online, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, or on our church website. I will be in the chat later on. I'd love to say hello to you as well. Let me pray for our service today. Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that no matter what is in front of us today, that you are there. No matter what challenge we're facing, no matter what circumstance we are facing today, you are bigger than that circumstance right in front of us. So I just pray that we'd be able to put that to one side right now, that we'd be able to focus on this service, open our hearts, open our minds to what you would have to say through this book of Daniel. What an incredible book. Uh, would you speak to us ever so clearly today? Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, again, doubly big welcome if it's your first time. Dive into the chat. I'm sure a couple of people are chatting in there right now. So go ahead and be brave and do that. One of the things we'd love for people to do every single week is to take a step. And the step that you could take is to step into authentic community here at Crossway Online. One of the ways that you can do that is by joining our online Facebook group. The team will pop a link into the chat where you can join that group. And I say hello to everybody on the inside as you are entering, I send you an email, I'll send you a Facebook message. So to be sure to watch out for that message because I love saying hello and getting to know you more. And one of the reasons why I want to get to know you more is to help you find your place in our community. Uh, and I speak to people all over the world and locally here in Melbourne as well. So um, we love to, to connect with you in that group. We also love for you to find a place in an online life group where you can go deeper with people uh, and, and share your faith and read the Bible together and pray together. Uh, so there's those opportunities are there for you as well. Uh, every single week I say that the mission of God is in the hands of ordinary people like you unlike me online uh, and one of the ways that you can sh share this service and live out that mission is by sharing the service literally uh, so if you're on facebook you can literally hit the share button you can tag someone in the chat right now invite them to watch with you or you can send it to them via a message if you're on youtube you can subscribe to our channel you can share it i know lots of people share our youtube services even if you're watching this back share it uh, you can send a whatsapp message facebook message a text message Go ahead and share the service. You never know what God is gonna do with your step of faithfulness to your friendship network, to your family network, to your work network. Let's join the team now. Let's open our hearts and open our minds to what God is gonna say to us and let's worship the Lord our God. Welcome to Church Crossway. Would you join us? We need to worship God together. Come on. If you're here with us in the room or you're joining us online, welcome to church. We need to worship God together this morning. Go on, church. Let's go.
else would rocks cry out to worship? His glory taught the stars to shine. Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing. But this joy is mine.
Through the flashes of color, all the voices proclaim forevermore. Sing holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty who was. Oh, no.
opened up the oceans I need you now to do the same thing for You are the same 
to be praised. And so we put our trust in You today, Lord God. We put our hope in You and our faith in You today in all the days of our lives, Jesus. We praise You, God. In Jesus' Name we pray. Amen and Amen. Good morning, church. It's so good to be here with you this morning. Uh, we're going to continue in a time of worship as we enter into communion. So I invite you uh, to be seated here in the room. Uh, if you weren't able to receive the communion elements on the way in, uh, I just invite you to raise your hand nice and high. Our team would love to come in and provide those to you. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Now's your opportunity to step out and prepare your elements if you haven't done so already. Coming out of uh, Easter, I was reflecting on communion and um, I'll be honest with you, one of the services over the Easter weekend, I grabbed my elements and then for whatever reason across the service, at the time that communion was being taken, I was pulled away or uh, kind of doing something else, perhaps looking after my daughter. I'm not exactly sure what I was doing, but what I am sure of is that I went home with the communion elements in my pocket. And I don't know if you're like me, but we have a basket uh, at my house, just near the front door, that just is kind of the catch all zone for anything that's been in your pockets. You get home and you empty out. And so it ends up having wallets and keys and vitamins and foreign currency and like little name tags from a conference you've been to in years past, whatever it is. But as I was reflecting and as I was preparing for communion, the elements in this catch-all basket really stood out to me because they looked incredibly misplaced amidst the kind of mess and busyness and general chaos perhaps that's going on in the rest of the basket. And you might be like me that you have this physical basket that kind of just catches all the messiness, but the, the truth is for all of us, we have a, a spiritual or emotional basket as well, don't we? That sometimes we, uh, as things kind of happen and, and pile on in our lives, perhaps we just kind of almost empty our pockets in this dismissive way where we just push something off to the side and we'll get around to it when the spring clean of the soul comes around at some point. And as we were, uh, as I was preparing, uh, 
as wrong as it looked to physically have the elements amongst the mess, I really felt that the Lord was saying uh, that the elements spiritually are not to be thrown to the side or buried or pushed away or treated in a dismissive manner. When we come before the time of communion, as we take the bread and the cup, as we take the body and the blood, we shouldn't be doing this in a dismissive way where it's just thrown away to a pile or just something that we go through the motions of doing. This is a sacred space. These elements are are sacred. And so as we step into this time of communion, I invite you as you look at the body and the blood of our Saviour, to just look through that kind of catch-all basket of your soul. And we'll take a moment to pause together. And I just invite you in that moment to cast aside the things that are filling that basket, whether it be perhaps your sickness or your sadness or your sin or your busyness, to cast those to the side and, and to bring the elements to the front of your mind, the blood, and the body of our Saviour broken for us while we were undeserving, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I invite you to pause and reflect now, focus on Jesus, and then I'll lead us as we take the elements together. on the night that Jesus was betrayed he broke bread and after he'd given thanks he said this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me church let's eat together After the meal, he took the cup and again, when he'd given thanks, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins of the many. Drink this in remembrance of me, church. Let's drink together. Lord Jesus, we fix our eyes on You, on Your broken body and Your blood poured out for us, Lord God. It's by Your stripes we are healed, by Your nail-pierced hands we're freed. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Lord, for Your sacrifice. May we not dismiss it, may we not bury it, may we not throw it to the side, but may it be front and centre of our minds as a church. And for each one of us, Lord God, may we remember the sacrifice once and for all for us to live in the freedom and the forgiveness that you have for us. We say thank you, Lord, as we take communion. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. It is so good to be here worshipping with you this morning. My name is Nick. I'm part of the team here. I want to extend a really warm welcome to those of you who are in the room here with us today and also for all of you who are joining us online now or across the course of the week. Uh, I invite you, if you are online, to say hi to Pastor Steve and his team. Get connected with our campus in at Crossway Online. If you're new here uh, in the room, I want to extend a very warm welcome to you. I'm so glad that you're here. And I invite you after the service just to head out of the centre of the auditorium and across to your right to our next steps area where our team would love to connect you in with the life of the church get to know some of your story uh, and help connect you in with others here at Crossway. There are so many opportunities throughout the course of any week to join together in worship, to be pressing in to what is happening here at the church. Uh, And I do invite you, if you'd like to at any time, to scan the QR code on the seat in front of you, follow any of the links that are coming up in the chat box to find out about what's happening in the life of the church. This Tuesday night here at Burwood East in our chapel, 
at 7 p.m. We have our Young Adults Together Night. So we invite you, if you're aged 18 to 30, to come and join the Together Night in the chapel on Tuesday. A few times every year as young adults, we get together and we worship and we praise and we pray. We're looking forward to hearing a word about true worship. And so we invite you to come along Tuesday evening if if you're a young adult. On Thursday morning at 10 a.m., also in the chapel, we invite you to our midweek worship service, our traditional worship service. And uh, this week, we're really excited to be hearing from Pastor Stuart Robinson. It's going to be a fantastic time of ministry. So let your boss know that you need Thursday morning off. Make sure you organise an arrangement to get there for 10 a.m. It's not to be missed this Thursday, our midweek worship service in the chapel. We really look forward to being there. As we enter into a time of prayer now, we acknowledge the mission that God has set before us here at Crossway is one for our city, for the nation and for the nations. And uh, as we step into a time of prayer, uh, today we will be praying together um, for the tragedy that occurred in Bondi yesterday, for the massacre, for the, um, the victims and all the onlookers and all those that have been touched by what is just an awful situation. Uh, we're so aware that we live in a world desperately in the need of the Lord. And so we really reach out, particularly to our Oak City family um, up in Sydney. We're, we're praying for you guys. Um, and so we'll join together and pray uh, for them. But also beyond our shores, um, we also acknowledge there's been a significant earthquake in Taiwan recently with thousands injured. Uh, unfolding in recent hours is a terrible missile attack being launched directed toward Israel as well. Isn't there just so much in our world that needs the intervention of our Saviour? And so as we pray, I I invite you as well to call to mind those things uh, that you are aware of and sensitive to uh, across the world. We'll be praying uh, for every situation that needs Jesus. So will you join me as we pray? Lord God, we come before You right now and and acknowledge Your sovereignty and Your grace, God. Everything was created through You and by You and we thank You for that, Lord. And and as we look around, there's so much hurt and and heartbreak in the world. And Lord, sometimes we we don't have the words, we don't have the words to say or, or to pray, but Lord, we do pray, come Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for for all those that have been affected by by the massacre in Bondi. Lord, I pray for grieving families. Lord God, would you be close? Would you be a comfort? Would you be a shelter for them? Lord God, I pray for those that are still fighting for their lives. Lord God, I pray that you would do your restorative work. Lord God, I pray for everyone who's taking care of those people that are still fighting for their lives. Lord Jesus, be with them. God, I pray for all the onlookers as well, for workers, for civilians, for families, for first responders. Lord God, who saw tragic events unfold with their eyes. Lord God, will you will you graciously be with them in the days going forward? Lord, we pray against trauma for any of these people, Lord God. Lord, I pray for the protection of their minds and their hearts and their souls in the coming days as they unpack the tragedy that's occurred. Come Lord Jesus. Lord, beyond our shores, for the people of Taiwan, God, we pray for those in in this time of rubble and uh, in this time of restoration, Lord God, will your will be done in that place, God. I pray for opportunities for Christian aid workers to be on the ground doing the restorative work and preaching the hope that we have in Jesus to those people. Lord, for the situation in Israel, God, we ask that you would come by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask for such a sense of protection over that place. Lord God, we pray that Israeli people would be turning their eyes to you. Lord Jesus, we pray for the situations all across the world that desperately need you. Lord God, would you be present? Lord, would people turn their eyes to you and focus on you and see the hope that comes through knowing Jesus in, in a world that without you, perhaps seems dark and devoid of hope, Lord. So we turn our eyes to You and we fix them on You, Lord. As we bring our tithes and offerings to You, Lord, we acknowledge 
the work that's happening at Crossway that is seeing people come to know Jesus in our city, nation and nations, Lord. We pray that You continue to do Your good work, that You flourish our tithes and offerings, that they would be used to be a blessing to many. Again, Lord, that they would be used so that many would come to know You, Lord. We commit ourselves to You now. We commit the rest of this service and our days ahead to You, Lord God. In Jesus' Name we pray. Amen and Amen. We are in our time of tithes and offerings now, so I do invite you, you'll see that there's containers at the end of your aisles. Uh, If you're on the end, if you could please um, pass those toward the centre of the auditorium uh, and then we'll pass our attention to Pastor Mark as he comes to bring the Word to us today. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Nick, for leading us so well and so sensitively this morning. Good morning, everyone. Let me say that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, it's good to be with you. Hey, good morning to those of you who are watching online too. Good to be with you. And also our South East Campus. Uh, this morning you, were, you didn't have access to your usual venue. So you are watching this service across a variety of homes in watch parties. So South East, great to be with you. And great to be in community with you in our Crossway Church. We hear lots of great things going on in your campus and all the fruit of the ministries you're involved in. And so we just be aware that we encourage you and we're often cheering for you back here at Bowdy. So good on you. Southeast. Hey, today we're going to continue our Living Among the Lions series as we track the story of Daniel. But today, it's interesting in the narrative we're going to look at today, Daniel is strangely silent and the spotlight is very much on his three mates. Three guys who were thrust not just into the spotlight, but wow, facing this huge test of faith. The heat was on. Will they wilt under extreme pressure? Or will they courageously stand firm? Now, Pastor Dale, last week, he introduced us to Daniel and his three mates as we walked through chapter one. And we see that they've been taken from their families and they are now in exile with many others in Babylon. And all four of them were given a bit of an education. They were given some duties, or they were being trained for palace duties. And from the age of 15 right through to 18, they graduated at the tender age of 18 into those duties. And it was fascinating, wasn't it? They were given those new names, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, all aligning with these Babylonian gods. And so here they would find themselves in a context now that was dishonouring to their own god. And we see right from the get-go their dedication to, to their God, our God, and their refusal to defile themselves by partaking in the delicacies that King Nebuchadnezzar had on offer for them. So the king finds them as impressive guys. He sees no equal compared to all four of them. We get to chapter 2 there and the king has this pretty random and complicated, confusing dream. And so Daniel comes along and interprets for him. So impressed by the interpretation was the king that he elevates Daniel into a pretty prominent role. He's made ruler over the entire province of Babylon and then Daniel has his three friends appointed as administrators over the province while he remains at the royal court. And so we come to chapter 3 now, our focus today. And we see that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they would collectively be facing this massive dilemma, one that would be a true test of their character and their love for God and a test of their allegiance to God. Now, those of you who love God, those of you who follow Jesus, those of us who use the Scripture as our bedrock, as our foundation for those values and those choices, those lifestyle choices we make in our lives, you will know that life is full of challenging and testing dilemmas. Do I stand firm in my Christ-like, my biblical convictions or do I conveniently toss them aside and take a hold of it and blend in with what the world is offering me at that point in time? And that was my dilemma back in the early 1990s. I'll never forget this. I was graduating from business school. I had a Bachelor of Business. It was time for me to get a job and stand on my own two feet. And so I went on this extended holiday after my studies had finished and I came home and I had the, uh, the, the long locks, the old bogan cut. I got it all cut off so I looked trim and I looked nice and really presentable for my interviews. I had my first lot of interviews with Kenworth Trucks. I didn't particularly like trucks, but hey, the, the job looked really, really good. And so I, I interviewed well. They seemed to be impressed so much so that I was shortlisted right to the pointy end. And it was just then down to me and this one other graduating student, a young girl. 
And the two of us sat side by side as we were given an, a final aptitude test. Well, it appears that she was more apt than me because she got the job and I was sent packing. So I was sent off to continue my search for work and then I uh, had another interview a few weeks later. It was with Telstra or then Telecom. And again, got through the short list and down to the pointy end. It was just two of us again, another one of those darn aptitude tests, which obviously didn't go very well at because that person got chosen and I was sent on my way again. And then I came across this job advert for an assistant manager in a local news agency. Now, this one intrigued me because I was interested in retail. The job was close by. I was out in the eastern suburbs. The hours looked good and the wage was really appealing. It was $25,000 per annum. Now, that doesn't sound very much to you right now, does it? But back in the early 90s, $25,000 for a young guy like me in my early 20s, wow, that, that were the days where potato cakes only cost 20 cents. Not a dollar fifty. Now, they were the days, can you believe it, where a two bedroom unit, brand new unit, cost under a hundred thousand dollars. You can't get your head around that now, can you? So that was that was the uh, the context I was living in. So twenty five grand, that would go a long, long way. I had the phone interview initially. It was all sounding good. Actually, I was pretty much promised the job. It was as good as a done deal. And so I went into the news agency just to feel, familiarise myself and acclimatise myself to the the climate I'd be working in. But then it dawned on me as I walked around. Hang on, I'd be the assistant manager in a store that was overtly promoting and selling pornographic magazines. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? And then there was this internal battle within me at the time, I can still remember it, where I, I should I turn a blind eye to it all? Because here I would be involved in over-the-counter sales for those very magazines. It didn't sit well with my spirit. It convicted, uh, it conflicted with the, the moral values that I have, the, uh, the biblical stance I have around sexual purity, knowing God's heart for sexual purity for his children. This conflicted with that. So do I turn a blind eye to that? Look, I, I'm not buying the magazines. I'm not opening them up. It's just, it's somebody else's choice. And look, it's a great wage and it's close by. It was all very convenient, yet the Holy Spirit was convicting me and I knew what I had to do. I had to pass that job in and that's what I did. I said no to the job in the end based on my convictions and my faith and my honour of my God and I had to turn that offer down and remain unemployed and continue the search and just trust that God would have my back, trust that he would have a job for me, the right job in the right time down the track. That's in fact what happened eventually. A job opportunity became available in the family business where someone mysteriously became ill all of a sudden and their position opened up in the sales department and I was able to take that up in a full-time employment. But I wonder if you can think of a time in your life where you were faced with a dilemma, when your faith and what was on offer were in conflict. I can think of a couple of examples. Some of you might even be able to relate to this. I've seen this happen in many of the churches I've been involved in over the years. That is, perhaps you're single, but you're yearning for that life partner, that soulmate that you can do life with. And so you go on a bit of a search for that partner and you, you find someone. This could be the one. There's sparks, there's fireworks. You've got a lot in common. You laugh together. You, you love telling stories. It's just, it's, it's all good. There's only one problem. That person doesn't love Jesus like you do. That person's happy for you to have your faith, but not at all interested in actually exploring that for themselves. What do you do with that? Desperately in need of companionship, wanting a soulmate for life. And, but you know what the Bible says about being equally yoked as you move into a marriage relationship. What do you do with that conviction? Do I just toss that aside for the sake of this relationship? Or do I hold firmly and honour God's heart for that relationship and just wait and believe he's got someone else for me? Or do I start missionary dating? And anecdotally, I reckon missionary dating has about a 10% success rate from my experience. Well, what about tax return time? Have you been in that situation where you've been filling out your tax return and you think to yourself, you know what? I could probably eke another three or $400 out of the government here. I feel like I'll get ripped off by the government anyway during the year, so perhaps I could get one back here by over-exaggerating my claim and over-exaggerating my expenses. Easy to do. No one's going to come knocking on my door. They've got bigger fish to fry the tax, say, uh, the tax people, so, hey, I reckon I could get away with this, an extra little bit coming my way. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? Because you know what God says and what his heart is around all things truth, around all things honesty, even though someone else might not be able to see what you're doing. What do you do when you're faced with these challenging dilemmas 
that will be before us every single day. They are constantly before us, testing us and challenging us. But I dare say, not at the same level as our friends in question today. This is a whole new level, what they're facing. And what we've got here, you've got King Nebuchadnezzar. And he has this huge 90 feet tall golden statue erected. It's nine feet wide. You couldn't miss it. And then he puts out this decree that whenever you hear the sound of this music, what might come from a harp or a horn or a lyre, any kind of music, you hear that music and immediately you have to bow down and worship that very thing, that golden statue. And if you don't, massive trouble. You'll be thrown into a fiery furnace where you'll have absolutely no chance of survival. And then we find the king is absolutely furious because he's made aware that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego don't want to have a bar of serving any of the gods that Nebuchadnezzar was putting before them. And certainly they were never going to bow down and worship this huge 90 feet tall golden statue. So he summons them into his presence and he threatens them with the fiery furnace. Come on, you guys got to bow down or you're getting thrown in. And he infers that no God, there is no God that can save you from that furnace. What a dilemma. What are they going to do? Do they fold? Do they simply blend in with the culture of the day and just do what everyone else is doing? That would be the easy thing to do. Will fear win the day? Or do they stick to their convictions and do they honour their God in their response? Well, let's have a look at how they respond. In Daniel 3 verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Wow, what a response. In the heat of that moment, What incredible courage. Now, last week, Pastor Dale highlighted Daniel's conviction and Daniel's allegiance to his God, our God. And he fleshed it out and applied it to our lives and encouraged us that as we develop our biblical and Christ-like convictions, we do so and hold on to them graciously. I want to add to that today and suggest that as we develop our convictions, we hold them not just graciously, there'll be times where we need to hold on to them courageously just like these three guys because there is a cost to discipleship make no mistake there'll always be a cost Uh, the question is will be we be willing to count that cost to step out in obedience to cop the heat that will come when you go against the grain of the culture that we live in and if you're not copping any heat in your life it might suggest you're not going against the grain setting yourself apart from that which is evolving around you to stand firm in what you believe. Those things are honour God and is consistent with those biblical and Christ-like values. These guys, they literally put their bodies on the line. They're willing to die rather than compromise their faith. So I want to highlight just four things that I trust encourage you today that might even challenge you that I take from this passage today. I made it easy for you. They all start with a letter C, the first one being conviction. Conviction is very much at play here. So these guys, they knew that there was only one and only true God worthy of their worship. And that was based on this long-held belief that they had that was embedded not just in their minds, but very much in their hearts. Uh, And conviction will always be aligned with belief. If you don't really know what you believe, you're not going to stand for much. You'll waver. If you don't really know what you believe, your conviction will waver and you'll give in to anything that appears enticing at the time. It's a little bit like a, a tree that sways around in the breeze, but it'll be more like a hurricane. You'll get, it'll be, your tree will become uprooted. Why? Because you don't stand for anything. And these guys, they don't waver. They don't even flinch an inch. Facing off with a furnace with faith that is unshakable and a conviction that is absolutely unbreakable. An astounding example and model to us. Picture yourself in their shoes as I do. What would I do in that situation? What would you do? 
in that situation. Flames, the imminent flames that will be leaping all around of you, a very clear decree from the king of all people, the, the promise of death that awaits, what would you do? You can understand people taking the safe option, couldn't you? But you know what? The safe option is not always the right option in God's eyes. We don't need to defend ourselves, they say. We don't need to defend ourselves. That is courageous conviction right there. Wow. Now, in our Aussie context, so the context of what we do, how we do life here in Australia, let's be fair. The, the, the test of Christian conviction that we experience is a lot softer than what a lot of Christians are experiencing in different parts of the world right now. I mean, for many people, for many Christians around the world, they are literally being persecuted for their faith, for their love of Jesus. People who are being stoned and bashed and ridiculed, some even being put to death just by mentioning the name, name of Jesus or bowing down and worshipping Him or being involved in a church service somewhere. That's why you find so many people worshipping in tunnels and, and underground churches and things around the world. People who are losing their life on the back of simply worshipping Jesus as we are doing today. Whereas in our Aussie context, for those people, it's a matter of life or death. For us, it doesn't tend to be that way, does it? For us, our test of obedience that will set us apart from societal norms will have us mocked, will have us ridiculed, will have us excluded. That's our cost. Yet that being the cost, are we still willing to count that cost in our Aussie context? Compromise is very much at play here too. So you've got Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They could easily have compromised their faith in this situation. And you want to understand them doing so. They could have simply blended in and continued to bow down and worship like everyone else is doing. No one would have batted an eyelid. No one would probably even notice. That's what everyone was doing. And they probably had some pretty decent excuses to, uh, to bow down. And I think of those excuses even now because I'm sure they came up with some initially thinking this through to try and navigate this very tricky situation they were in. I mean, they could have bowed down to this golden statue but not really worshipped the golden statue. Well, they could have bowed down and thought, well, God will forgive us because God knows where our heart really is at. Or look, it's the king and we better obey the king of all people. Although we're in this foreign land, and when you're in a foreign land, there'll be foreign customs that we ought to get behind and adhere ourselves to, so they can make excuses in that way. And look, they've got a whole lot of fellow brothers and sisters who are also in exile. What good is it if we're dead? They need our help. We can bear influence on their lives in the positions that we're in. So lots of excuses they could easily have come up with. Ones that seem quite justifiable on face value, yet in opposition to God's ways. And to worship an alternative God would be violating God's very clear demand in Exodus 20 verse 3. And these guys would have known that. You shall have no other gods before me. So if they were, they were to compromise, they would also eliminate their testimony. They'll eliminate the testimony of pointing people to this great and powerful God but by standing firm in their convictions and not compromising, they would show the people around them just how relevant their God is, our God is, and how our God supersedes any God that Nebuchadnezzar could put before them. And perhaps you can relate to those excuses because we are tempted to compromise on a daily, daily basis. Our convictions are often put to the test. And um, I can think of a very simple example. And most of you will be able to, actually, I think all of us can relate to this. There's a question that we generally get asked most weeks by people in the workplace or in our neighbourhood or in wherever we might be in our networks. It's a very simple question. It's got a very simple answer. But for some reason, we find the answer a little hard at times. Here's the question. What did you get up to yesterday? What did you do yesterday? It's interesting that often we have selective amnesia when coming to answer that question. Because... We sometimes duck and weave around the full truth and give a partial truth to that question. Instead of going with, 
well, look, I, I went to church yesterday at Crossway amongst the, uh, hundreds of others and heard this message. Or I went to a life group where I do life with a group of fr- friends from my church and we studied the book of Daniel. And oh, look, I went to this awesome Easter presentation where 20 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ. And I went to this baptism service where I heard eight testimonies of people who had their life changed because they've dedicated their hearts to Jesus. But instead, we often go to the place of, oh, I went to the movies. Oh, I went to the cinema, saw this incredible movie. Oh, I just watched some TV last night, married at first sight. Oh, so I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. And we start talking about that. Imagine if we told the whole truth and the conversations that might then transpire as a result, the conversations we miss out on because we don't tell them what we were actually doing, which is a big part of who we are and our love for Jesus. Why do we compromise? Why do we do that? It's quite simple. So we fit in. So we blend in. Everyone likes to fit in and blend in. So we do, we compromise to fit in, to avoid ridicule, to avoid isolation, and also because it's the easy thing to do. I don't have to explain myself by just saying to people, just went to the movies, went to a restaurant. Why do we compromise? See, to compromise actually takes us away from the heart of God and simply reinforces those secular norms and morals in our society that apparently we also adhere to because our life looks no different. We don't appear to be set apart in any shape or form. I can think of a good example of this in my own life. Uh, many years ago now, for years I was fortunate to represent our state in field hockey. So every year I'd go away for two weeks, somewhere in Australia where the national championships were held. And we would always stay in a hotel together. And on this particular trip, I remember being in a hotel room and we just had the big team meeting. The coach had taken us through a review of the, the game we just had that day and, and then planning for the next team that we're about to play the next day. At the end of the meeting, it all finished. He said, OK, we're going to have some entertainment now. And I thought, oh no, where's this going? Knowing the sort of entertainment a lot of these guys were into. And sure enough, We sat down and presented with a pornographic movie that we were going to watch together as a team. What do you do with that? As a Christ follower, as a Jesus follower, who has biblical convictions to live by, what do you do with that? Well, you know, I danced around with it in that moment because, again, I had some excuses. I could easily have compromised. After all, this was my team. And you've got to do things as a team. You hang together. You can't walk out on your teammates, can you? Whatever it is that you're doing together. And I started to justify, well, perhaps I can close this eye and, and squint the other eye and sort of just look through like that and I wouldn't see anything. And, well, oh, gee, it might be interesting anyway. I might, I might learn a couple of things. And I, and I was going through all these reasons to blend in. But instead... I chose to walk out. And I can still remember it as clear as day as I walked out. I got insulted. I got teased. They were throwing barbs at me as I went. But you know what? That was ridiculing and teasing I continually received from the same sorts of teammates for years as I walked away from many other situations like that. Based on the convictions that I had around things like sex, alcohol, gambling and foul language. I was different. I was different to all the guys. And I was happy to be different. And you know what? I should be different. Because God calls us to be set apart. That our lives will look different, but the heat will come. The ridicule will be there. Make no mistake. And that was my experience too. But if I was to compromise in those sort of situations, and there are others like that, my life would bear no testimony. There'd be no testimony to my faith And it would be dishonouring to God in the process. It was interesting, many years later, a couple of my closer friends from teams I played with over the years came to me and said, you know what, we just want to apologise to you. I said, well, what for? So you know how we used to tease you and ridicule you for years there? We used to do that because we could see that you had something that we didn't. And then we had this profound conversation that came out of that. Okay, confidence. And boy, were these guys confident. I love the way that they are so sure of their God and their faith that they're able to say this. The God we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us. So they had this confidence. They believed in his power to save them. And also they believed in his promises that he would be there with them in the flames. So they're relying on God here. And and when you have a reliance on God, when you rely on God, your faith then has an anchor point. 
And that reliance was so strong that even if God wouldn't spare them their lives, they had this to say, even if he does not, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods or worship any other image. Now that is powerful because what they're saying is that even if things don't work out like we hope they might, we're still going to go through with this. We are, we are not going to die forsaking our Lord. If we die, knowing that we'd forsaken Him, we wouldn't be able to live with ourselves in that sense. So it's amazing. It's amazing what they're doing here. Dying knowing that they'd forsaken God wasn't an option. They were going to hang tough and stay consistent with their faith regardless. And I think that's a really important point because it's not like they've said to God, okay, we're going to hop in the flames, God, but we'll only do it if you promise. They actually stepped out in faith, believing that God would see them through. They didn't put a caveat on it or anything. And so for us, even when we have no idea what the outcome of our courageous conviction may be, we can trust that God's got it. We can trust that God's got us in the palm of His hands and He won't let us down. The important thing is that glorifying God, regardless of the circumstances of life, regardless of whatever impending outcomes that might come, that's the important thing. We'll glorify our Lord God no matter what. That's the important thing. Their faith in God was more important than their fear of death. That was clear. And sometimes for us, life is tough, is it not? Life can be really, really tough. Life can be scary. And some of us even right now are facing the furnace of life. Some of you are in situations where the flames are burning brightly and you're being singed and it's, it's tough. You're feeling the heat in the workplace as a Christian. Or perhaps you're feeling the heat in a dysfunctional relationship. Perhaps you're feeling the heat in your finances and it feels like it's all doom and gloom. There's pain, there's no way out. You can't see a way forward. Hear this. Stand firmly by your conviction in who God is. Don't waver. Don't compromise your faith. Don't look for the easy way out. But have confidence in a God who sees you, who understands your pain, that sees your dilemma, sees the furnace that you're in, and actually wants to walk with you in that. He wants to rescue you and deliver you in time. So hang in there. God is with you just like He was with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And God never promised that we wouldn't have difficult times. But He did promise that He'd be with us in them. Isaiah 43, 2 is a case in point. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. So even when the flames in your life are hot, even when they're really, really intense, God can keep you safe. He will give you strength to endure and then move beyond them and forward. And that strength will come from a deep, abiding, invested relationship with our Father in heaven. It won't come through a shallow relationship. It won't come through a ho-hum faith. It won't come through just ticking a few religious boxes. It'll come out of an invested, deep, loving relationship with your Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit would endow you with the strength and the courage that you need to endure whatever flames you find yourself in. Last one, camaraderie, a word we don't often use these days, but if you look at the definition of camaraderie, you'll see that it's that feeling of trust and friendship among a group of people who have travelled life's journey together for some point of time. Now that's what's happening here. What's noticeable here with these three mates is that they're in this together. They have come the journey together. They're supporting one another. They've made decisions together. They're going to hop into that furnace together. It's not just uh, perhaps two of you, look, you, you two hop in and uh, we'll spare you so you can carry on. No, no, all three are going to do this together, modelling an incredible friendship as they do. Now, it reminds us with our faith journey that our faith journey ought not be a lonely one ought not be an isolating one, that we need people to journey alongside of us, with us. We need fellow brothers and sisters in Christ alongside of us in the cut and the thrust of life. It's why we often in the context, and I say this to our friends at South East and online as well, we talk about the importance of being in life groups together. We say that not just for numbers sake, but for life's sake. Because in life groups, it's where you get to journey with other fellow believers. You get to champion each other. You get to support each other. You laugh together. You cry together. You eat together. You open the Word together. You pray for one another. It's a wonderful life-giving space to be a part of. We talk about the importance of being mentors in our lives, giving permission to someone to say the hard things to you when you need to hear them first and most. 
Have people supporting you and speaking into your life. There is great strength in relationship. It's where iron sharpens iron. It's where wisdom is sought and received. It's where prayer is received. It's where practical, emotional and spiritual support can be given during the really hard times and the tough times in life. We need each other in our journey of faith. Don't fight the flames by yourself. And men, you need to hear this in particular because men, we are notorious at internalising and keeping things in here, thinking it's a show of weakness to cry out for help. It's not, a, it's not a show of weakness. It's actually a show of strength to speak up. I encourage all of us, don't fight your flames alone. Share your struggles. Ask for help. Invite people into your dilemmas because God uses our relationships to strengthen us and to grow us in our lives. It's like we're being Jesus to one another. So with all of this, what was the outcome? What was the outcome for these three? Well, the king, he was furious. So he orders the the furnace to be turned up, the heat to be turned up seven times hotter than usual. So hot was it that the soldiers that tossed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego into the furnace, they died as a result. How's that for a job? That's how hot it was. Something amazing happened though. The king looks into the furnace and he sees three men walking around unbound. They're not tied up anymore. They're walking around in no apparent discomfort. It is absolutely amazing. And he sees a fourth guy walking around with them who he describes as a son of the gods. Now that fourth person was obviously supernatural, an angel perhaps, but God sends some help. A heavenly visitor to accompany these guys, these faith-filled guys in their time of need, in their trial. The king calls them out of the fire, totally unharmed. No no hair on their head was even singed. Their clothing not scorched. They don't don't even smell of smoke. He was absolutely astonished. So much so that the king acknowledges that the greatness of their God, our God. And then he actually elevates them. He promotes these three friends to higher positions in the province. They're rewarded for their firm and unshakable conviction and shakeable faith. So let me say, when we hold firmly, when we hold firmly to our convictions and we disregard compromise and set it aside and we exercise a confidence in God and who He is and even doing so together, people are watching. People are noticing how you deal with the furnace in your life the choices that you're making, the decisions you're making, the context of your life, whatever it might, people are watching. They're always watching. The king was watching. The king noticed and he was moved to respond. Yes, he elevated them into these higher positions, but also there was, he was that conception. He conceded that their God was the one true God. But what about Daniel as we come to a close here? Because here we are, we've uh, got a sermon series that is uh, honouring the name of Daniel. In many ways, we're honouring God and highlighting Daniel's trajectory. Yet in chapter 3, no word of Daniel at all. It's quite intriguing. Not, Not a word is spoken of Daniel's involvement in this narrative. What does that mean? Did he blend in? Did he bow down to the statue? We don't know. Because the scripture is strangely silent on that one. And we presume not. But we just don't know. But what we can assume is that he watched, he watched his friends go through this ordeal, or at least he heard what they were going through. But just like the king, we can only assume that Daniel was greatly impacted by his friends role modelling here and their example. Why? Because I think we can make that assumption because as you fast forward through Daniel, you come to chapter six and something similar was happening. It was the then King Darius of the day says to the whole nation, you will bow down to me. You will pray only to me and no other gods. And that was the decree that he set. And if you were seen praying to anyone or anything else, you'd be sent into a den of lions, a little bit like the furnace, hey? And so we see Daniel's response in that moment. Instead of bowing down to that decree and that king, He would often rush home, go upstairs to the upper room, open up his windows in full view of people and he would pray and give thanks to his God, our God, three times a day. He wasn't going to cower to that decree. He wasn't going to fall in line with that one. So consistent here with the same conviction that his three friends had courageously exhibited when they were facing off with the furnace. See, when you stand firm in your convictions, when you stay true to your faith, people watch 
and we trust and pray that lives will be transformed as a result. So just in conclusion, if you're going through a fiery trial right now, and it's possible that some of you are, yep, a lot of us are going through a rosy season of life, that's all good, celebrate that. But there'll be times where you're going through a trial, where you feel like your faith is being tested, where you are tempted to compromise your faith and step away from your convictions because it's easier to do. I want to encourage you, hold on strongly. Hold to your Christ-like convictions courageously. Don't waver, stand firm and trust that God will bring you through because He will. It may not be easy, it may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow. But like Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego, you are not alone in the fire. Your God is with you. He's with you every step of the way. He's protecting you, He's walking beside you. He's in the flames with you. Don't lose hope as you face your furnace because you face it with God right alongside of you. He is with you. And may your testimony bear witness to His greatness for those who are watching on. Let's pray together. Well, God, we are very grateful for this this narrative, this story that we tell today. For the example of these three awesome men of God who teach us so much, who challenge us in many ways. And we think even in our own lives right now, and for those of you who are online, you're included in this, our Southeast friends. Some of us are in the fire right now. We feel like we're in that fiery furnace. And it's not easy. The flames are flicking all around us. We feel like we're being singed. We feel like it's about to take a hold of us. Whatever that furnace looks like for you, ask God to come upon you and to embed within you a strength and a spiritual resolve that only He can give you. And to resist the temptation for an easy worldly way out. God, would You come to us? Would You come to us in our time of need? And we know even in the heavenlies, there's a, there's a great battle going on in the sense that the God of Israel, our God versus the gods of Nebuchadnezzar, which relate to the evil in this world that's on offer, that's so often enticing. There's a battle going on for our minds and our hearts and our lifestyle choices. May You win that battle, Lord God. We want You in that fight. And may we have the strength to stand firmly day by day by our Christ-like convictions, ones that would honour You in the process. And we want to thank You too, Lord God, that ultimately there is great victory. We think of the the flames and the furnace that is referred to in the New Testament Gospels. The ones that highlight the, the, the eternal flames, the separation from You for those who choose to go down their own pathway, to go down the, the Nebuchadnezzar God way and to leave You behind. But Jesus came died for us on that cross for our sins to show us and give us life and life in its fullness. He rose from the dead and had victory over those eternal flames and we can have that victory too in our own lives. And so let's claim that victory even now in the furnace of our own experience. Lord God, would You come to us and would You instill that victory within us? Would You fill us with a faith that victory will indeed come? And we claim that victory in the Name of Jesus Christ over anything that the world can toss at us that would have us compromise You. Come Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, touch us afresh and may we walk in the victory that is ours in Jesus Christ, in whose Name we pray, Amen. Amen indeed, how about we stand and let's sing this song, sing it in that spirit of victory in your life. Let's sing in faith. There is another in the fire Standing next to me there is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another keeps singing that. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another. The waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need a reminder?
So Lord, we great stand. message from Pastor Mark. You know, you can live that life with confidence, no matter what is in front of you, uh, like they were in that fiery furnace. The, the, the circumstances in front of them would have been overwhelming, but they could have approached it with confidence that God was going to come through for them. Uh, they, they approached it with camaraderie as well. In community, um, no one had to go through that alone. And we want you to know here at Crossway that you don't have to go through life alone. There's community here for you that would love to rally around you. One of the ways that we can do that is by praying for you. Maybe that your situation in your life is bigger than you can possibly imagine, like that fiery furnace. We would love to pray for you. We would love to pray that God will move in your life just as he did in that situation. So the offer is open to you. We'll pop a link into the chat uh, on Facebook and on YouTube where you can get prayer straight away. Uh, those prayer requests go to me and my team. We'd love to pray for you. Uh, if you're on our church website, you can literally hit the request prayer button and one of our team will pray with you right on the spot. But don't leave it. You know, I know, I get your messages every week. Some of you are dealing with really tough circumstances. That fiery furnace is right in front of you and you need prayer. Only God can change the outcome. So go ahead, share uh, with each other in the chat. If you, want, if you need prayer in the chat, you can go into the chat or you can click on those links. We would love to pray for you. Really, really important. Maybe after this service now, you've gone, whoa, I know someone that needs this message. I know someone that needs to hear it. Uh, so go ahead and share that with your friends and your family. If you're on Facebook or YouTube, or on the church website, there are opportunities to share. Again, you can do it via text message, through uh, Facebook messages, through WhatsApp. Go ahead and be brave, because you never know what God will do with such a powerful message of hope and perseverance, community, with what Mark spoke about today. So that's about it for today's service. I hope you have an incredible week. And again, that offer is out there if you want to join our Facebook community, uh, just like it was at the start of the service. Uh, for the rest of you, God bless you. Have a great week.